Quite often, a lot of athletes and coaches aren't quite sure on what distribution of their training should be high intensity, how much long slow should we do, and what the breakdown in the week uh, really should look like. And I know I've covered this in bits and pieces on the channel before, but I thought I'd put together a bit of a summary around the common training intensity distributions that we see across endurance athletes and athletes in general, which ones are the better ways to go about it and, and why are they so effective. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Nick here, making sports science simple. And in today's video, we're talking about training intensity distribution fundamentally. And ultimately, what is the best way to break up your training? Is it to go down the path of the 80-20 split or the polarized approaches, what it's commonly called? Do we have a bit more of a, a mix of intensities in there? Some thresholds, some of that really high intensity VO2 work, and then some of that, that long, slow, continuous as well. Or do we go all in on things like threshold and the race specific side of things? That's what I'm gonna break down. They're really the three key uh, training intensity distributions. And ultimately, training intensity distribution, if you're not sure what that means, is, is basically what that graph, if you look at like Garmin Connect or Strava or any of the apps that you might use to track your training and, and sort of upload your training to, record it, they'll have a bit of a breakdown of, of heart rate zones and how much time you spent in zones. And that's fundamentally what we're looking at. And depending on how many zones you use, I commonly use five, and you would have heard me on this channel talk about a five zone system. It, a lot of other people might talk about a three zone system or a seven. It doesn't really matter. It's just understanding, fundamentally, we're talking about intensity distribution across our three key components of our physiology. And, and ultimately, even more importantly, below and above our two key components, which is below our VT1 or LT1, so ventilatory threshold one or LT1 is lactate threshold one. Below there is all of our long, slow, continuous stuff. So that, that's going out and doing your long, slow base case and that, that all day pace stuff, that really good aerobic capacity work. Between LT1, so lactate threshold one and our lactate threshold two, or what's normally termed our functional threshold or anaerobic threshold. That's all of our more thresholdy based stuff, tempo, sweet spot, sub threshold, threshold intervals, that's all mixed in in there. And then anything above that, that sort of anaerobic threshold or that functional threshold intensity it is all of our really high intensity stuff. So if we just keep it simple today and talk about those three components, um, you can break those into micro zones or smaller zones. And I, I use five zones to split those up. But fundamentally in terms of my system, if you've looked into some of my videos before, I'm talking about zone two, zone three, and zone four really here. Everything outside of that is just gonna be above and below. So they're kind of included. And, and so when we're looking at this training intensity distribution, we're talking about, well, how do we make up our week? How do we know how much of each is gonna be the best bang for buck? And if you watched a previous video I put up recently on the channel talking about the physiology uh, and the, the pathways of activating some of our really key aerobic adaptations, that sort of broke down the, the ideas of why maybe something like a polarized approach might be the better way to go. If you haven't watched that, I'll link it above uh, and also down below in the description. Go check that one out first because it gives you a bit of background info into some of the in, uh, insights I'm gonna take you on in a little bit. So the first, uh, I guess the first place uh, we wanna look at in terms of training intensity distribution is the really, really common one for a lot of endurance athletes. And that's what we call the threshold approach or the threshold model. Now looking at this is, it's basically having a pretty even split of long, slow, sub VT1, um, nice endurance, continuous um, type training, building those really good aerobic positive adaptations in terms of mitochondrial change and, and improving our slow twitch fibers, all of that great stuff. But then having a pretty even split of that with more threshold based training. So whether that be doing threshold intervals at, at your, your anaerobic or your functional threshold, whether that be doing some sweet spot training on the bike, over under type stuff, maybe doing some um, some tempo runs, all of that sort of middle, often term gray zone intensity, having a pretty even split between your long, slow, good stuff in your zone two, your base case, and some some of that sort of gray zone. And then a maybe a little bit, but often not much, if at all, any very high intensity uh, aspects uh, above your functional threshold. Now this approach is, is is great if we're looking at specificity. So that's a, the, the big, I guess, plus of this, is it's very specific. A lot of our endurance events happen in that sort of gray, don't they? They're a little bit above that really easy, um, really easy all day pace, because ultimately we want to race and we want to go fast and push ourselves and challenge ourselves. That's what the point of the events and races are, to see how hard and fast we can go. But it's not hard enough to get those really bang for buck um, top end adaptations in terms of VO2 and pushing things along. So that's where it falls a bit more race specific. We're just practicing what we need to go through in the event. So from that perspective, it is very good for that, 
But it, I've already sort of covered the, the negative of that type of training intensity distribution of having a lot of that middle ground, a lot of the long slow and then not much at the top end at all it is that we end up in this period of we're doing a lot of very similar amounts, amounts of training or similar um, training across the week. We got very similar intensities. There's not much gap between the zone two and zone three. Um, if we're talking five zone system, we're not much gap between our base Ks and our tempo end up being this sort of wishy-washy, like we say, gray zone, and it all becomes a bit the same. And that's where we get into some trouble uh, in terms of some, some factors, in terms of a bit of monotony. And we're gonna cover that in a future video and also a high training load um, or training strain, if you like, week in, week out, because it's all it's all sort of, we're, we're constantly pushing a bit too hard in our, our easy sessions and not pushing hard enough in our hard sessions um, to, to really get those bang for buck aerobic adaptations. Like I said, it fundamentally comes down to that just as specific as possible. So when might I use a bit of this in an athlete's preparation, usually I'll bring that in as a really, really last part of the program where we probably can't get any fitter than we already are. There's no big gains to have. It's not gonna be a dramatic shift in someone's performance, but it is gonna help us tune up and just get as race specific as possible, or race fit, if you like. And this might be going and doing, for example, a 70.3 triathlete might go and do three or so weeks out an Olympic distance race. That fits in really well here. On threshold, on the limit for a, for a sort of hour 45, two hours, two hours 15, however long it takes you, um, really in that, that sort of middle ground. It's a good one to just get us into some of that race feel. Is it gonna be a, a game changer for our aerobic improvements? Probably not. Is it gonna help us to sit on race intensities on race day? it's going to help us get there to an extent. So that's where this sort of comes in, but I, I tend to stay away from this for the most part uh, when we are looking at those more broader adaptations and trying to drive some really positive improvement because it doesn't really do a lot for us. There's not much in that middle ground that's giving those big key aerobic adaptations. It's really just tuning up for racing. And, and that's one of the big mistakes I see a lot of athletes make and a lot of coaches make is because he's so race specific, we think, oh, we've got to be specific all the time, specific, specific, specific. But we forget to we forget to miss that balance of when is it more appropriate to go after the big key foundational adaptations and going to allow us to work harder in those sessions. Because ultimately, if we if we if we get a bigger improved aerobic engine, we can run harder and faster as a result of that by maybe following a bit more of some of these other approaches in a second. Then we come and use this as a bit of a tuning up tool, this threshold approach to tuning up tool. If I've got a bigger, faster engine, I'm going to be able to run harder and faster in those specific sessions. So I'm just practicing running harder and faster, which is gonna to lead to a potentially better outcome. So I like to bring this in really late. Like I said, last sort of six or so weeks is probably the max I'll really go aggressively into this distribution. I use some of these other approaches a bit more extensively throughout preparations for a lot of, a lot of athletes. Um, and that doesn't actually change in terms of distance. I'll just, in distance of event or time of the event, triathlete, runner, cyclist, whatever it might be, it usually just changes the length of how long uh, I'll stay in this this period for tends to be the longer the event I might just use this period a little bit more because we've probably had a lot longer prep beforehand to get those big foundational adaptations initially moving into the second one this is the most popular one I think 80 20 or the polarized approach is something that has sort of taken the endurance industry by storm over the last little while and lots of people sort of love to talk about it but I also think a lot of people don't fully understand what the, the backing of this principle is. And really this polarized approach comes about because it suggests in this 80, the 80, 20 rule that people talk about, it suggests that 80% of our time or approximately 80%, you don't have to physically go in and manually calculate, well, I did nine hours and 29 minutes of training um, or I'm planning to do that. What is 80% of that? You don't have to go to that extent. It's very rough guideline, but predominantly we're looking at 80% of our training thereabouts of our long, slow, continuous. This is our sub VT1, this is our long, slow base case, zone two on a on a five zone system, zone one on a three zone system. Um, those really good positive aerobic capacity adaptations, those muscle endurance adaptations, working through uh, that mitochondrial change, all of that good stuff, 80% of our time is spent there because that's the bulk. We can't we can't just always do high intensity. We have to, like the volume part is the, is the much easier part to build um, at a lower intensity. So it makes sense to do bulk of our training there. Then we bring in that 20% uh, component of our training is way up the top end. We're talking well above functional threshold, um, functional threshold power or pace, right up near VO2 max, working again on that good activation of that PGC1A, that master switch I talked about in that previous video. And again, it's linked below, so you can have a check, have a check out about what that all sort of means. But really it's that activator or that, that light switch, if you like, for those really good aerobic adaptations happens at the long slow and happens right at the top. So this approach really, this polarized approach is just trying to maximize the time we're doing in those two zones, developing as much of the adaptation as we can. So I use this for the majority of 
my athletes across the majority of their preparation, largely in their general prep or their base phase, their aerobic base phase, aerobic phase, whatever you want to call it. Um, that, that period of a couple of months, um, we've still got maybe three months until our, uh, our event or maybe 10 weeks till our event. But really, if we, the, the three, four months prior to that, so for a 70.3, that might be, uh, if we're racing in six months time from now until about two months out from, from racing, is that is that period there, I'm definitely going for this polarized approach because it's giving, give me the best bang for buck in terms of returns on aerobic adaptations and building the overall size of the engine. Where it falls down a little bit, and if we are being a bit nitpicky here, where it falls down is it's not as specific. And that's where that threshold approach can come in later and top up that specificity specificity of that sort of missing piece in the middle because we're not doing any uh, we're not doing much if any of that sort of middle ground threshold sub threshold tempo -y type stuff at all it's either low or it's really high and, and uh, i guess that that point is to maximize like i said maximize those adaptations maximize those signaling pathways to get the adaptations happening um, in as much of our training as possible it also allows us to have a really good training variety across the week and day-to-day -day variety so or, or variability and what i what I love about that is not only does it keep the training interesting because each day there's, all right, it's a hard session today, then maybe t tomorrow and the day after is a little bit e easier, but I'm doing a bit more volume, so that's going to challenge me. We're getting this varied stimulus and almost this sort of undulating uh, sort of wave pattern. And, and what that leads to is lower monotony. So monotony fundamentally is the variation in training day to day. High monotony, if we're doing very similar things day in, day out, it's really, really hard to recover from because it's the similar stress on the body again and again and again. If one day we have high volume, uh, but low intensity and the next day we have low volume but we have high intensity, it's this much more varied stimulus and it's giving the body some different challenges. But that variation is actually much easier to tolerate than having the same thing again and again and again because we're getting we're getting different different signaling pathways, different parts of our physiology activated. So so it's 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 just keeping things a little bit fresher um, and working on a multi-aspect component. But ultimately like I said that that low monotony is going to allow us to recover a little bit better and, and, and sort of lead to things like reduced illness, be able to get up for sessions better and actually be actually able to perform better in each of those sessions as well. So that's a really effective part of that 80-20 process, which ultimately if we can recover better, we're not getting sick as often, we're able to perform better in those sessions, we're gonna get better adaptations as a result of being more consistent in our training anyway. So that's another, I guess, the, the final piece to look at is we can maximize our bang for buck by using that approach. And also the literature in terms of the research actually suggests this is probably the best way to go for majority of your training anyway. The third and final training intensity distribution I wanted to touch on here is what we call the, uh, the pyramidal, pyramidal uh, approach, which is kind of a mix of threshold and 80-20 or, or threshold and polarized. And what I mean by that is there's still a good emphasis on uh, the long slow. So that's where our biggest component or, or biggest amount of training intensity distribution is. There's still that really good high intensity aspect, not quite as much as 20%. We might drop that down to maybe 10, 13%, somewhere in that range of our total training week is dedicated to that really good high intensity VO2 stuff. But then there's this period in the middle um, uh, that we fill in with some of that more thresholdy, sweet spotty type type intensity. And I guess where this starts to come in for me is a bit of a transitioning type phase, um, working from that really just pure polarized approach, heading towards some race specific. And, and that's where I'll spend a bit more time basically at and at around functional threshold. I'm not necessarily, for me, I'm not necessarily bringing in things like tempo runs and that. I've got say a, a half marathon, I'm probably looking at maybe eight weeks out or 10 weeks out, I start to transition into this a bit. I still have my VO2 stuff in there. Maybe I'm now manipulating work to rest ratio. Maybe I'm challenging it. Instead of one to one work to rest, I might go to two to one and three to one. Just drop the intensity slightly, but I'm still working at or just above uh, our functional threshold. So I get some time in that middle, but I'm not really uh, I'm not really spending masses and masses of time. It's just a bit of a, uh, I'm kind of getting a bit of everything. It's a good transition into some really race specific, but I still get my VO2 and I've still got a big emphasis on the long slow. Not quite in my eyes, not quite as good as the polarized approach. And the research supports that a little bit, but it is definitely more effective than the threshold approach because we've still got our very, very high intensity VO2 type work and our, our bulk of our focus is on the long slow base case um, continuous training as well. So it, it might be a better option if you still wanna keep some of that specificity in there, but not necessarily miss out. The only thing I guess you have to be a bit careful of is that um, particularly because there's, we're trying to do a couple of things here, we start to have to balance a little bit more around uh, the fatigue and, and load monitoring aspects. So this is where we wanna be careful that we're not trying to achieve too much. We're not trying to cram too much into the one week. And that's where I see something for the most part, the 80-20 polarized approach for the majority of your preparation and then and then flicking to a, a pyramid, 
pyramidal approach, pyramidal approach, or um, maybe a thresholdy type approach. Either or is probably okay. Um, I, I like the fact that we still keep some of that VO2 stimulus in there. That's probably where I might lean that pyramidal approach uh, for majority of our shorter distance. Um, maybe 5K, 10K type runners, um, maybe your road races or your crit type races. I like to keep some of that VO2 in. Again, you just gotta be careful of balancing the training load, but if you do manage it correctly, it can be really, really effective in that more specificity aspect. Because now we're just starting to bring in what is most specific to the event. We're still keeping some of those adaptations, but it's probably not gonna be as effective as just going all in on that polarized approach. So there's a couple of different training intensity distributions. Hopefully that sort of clears it up a bit in terms of splitting your week. My preference and my priority is always gonna be on that polarized approach. Best bang for buck in terms of aerobic adaptations and maximizing uh, our VO2 max, maximizing our aerobic engine, all that good stuff in the general adaptation phase. Then you can transition to a bit more of a pyram pyramidal approach or a, a threshold approach as we get a bit more race specific, but they're that short term gain. If you want the long-term big adaptations, go 80-20 or go polarized. If you're wanting really specific short-term adaptations just to get up in the next four or six weeks for a particular event, that's where I'd switch to those other two approaches. So hopefully you got a bit out uh, of this video. Have you reflected on your training intensity distribution? Is it matching what you thought it was or is it following a different approach? Let me know uh, what approaches you follow or what you're currently going through at the moment. Always love to hear your thoughts uh, in the comments below. Otherwise, I've talked already a little bit today. That's gonna, gonna leave it there and we'll see you in the next one.